Welcome to version 3 of my history of Sony Pictures Television. This time I am going to narrate it all the way from the studio's humble beginnings in 1947. I'd just like to take you through the legend first. Anything in a blue box is a distinct corporate entity which will usually end with Inc, LLC or Limited. Anything in a green box is a legally recognized trading name used by a person, company or more than one company. Anything in a red box is either an internal corporate division referred to in company literature but nothing else or a brand name used on screen that isn't a legally recognized trading name. The black writing is the line of business in which a particular company is involved. So anyway, without any further ado, let's get to the rest of the video. The history of Sony Pictures Television essentially began in 1947 with a television commercial production firm known as Pioneer Films set up by Ralph M. Cohn. There's not really much to say here, except that Ralph Cohn happened to be the nephew of Harry Cohn, who was in charge of Columbia Pictures. With the Cohns being infamous for nepotism, as was the norm in the industry at the time, it was therefore no surprise that Pioneer Films was acquired by Columbia Pictures just one year later in 1948. The company was incorporated as Screen Gems Inc. in New York, a name borrowed from Columbia's dormant cartoon subsidiary in California, which had grown out of Margaret Winkler's distribution firm many years previously. The newly incorporated wholly owned subsidiary of Columbia Pictures Corporation continued to produce television commercials for the next three years. In Sony's PR, Screen Gems is often glorified as the first television studio established by a major Hollywood studio. However, as I've just explained, Columbia didn't actually establish Screen Gems in 1948, they merely acquired it. It also seems to gloss over Paramount Television Productions, which was formed around the same time by a rival studio to oversee and program the ill-fated Paramount Television Network. This would have been a full TV studio rather than a commercial producer like Screen Gems. Anyway, now that I've all but debunked this piece of Sony lore, let's move on. 1951 was the year in which Screen Gems became a fully-fledged television studio. It moved into the new and lucrative field of telefilm syndication and started producing its own television series in 1952. It began using an animated logo at this point. There was still a mentality in Hollywood at this point that movie studios shouldn't be involved in the new, this new threatening medium of television. Sound familiar? Anyway, as if the viewers at home gave two hoots about this, the Screen Gems logo used at this time was designed to conceal the connection to Columbia Pictures. Stars shining inside a TV tube gave no apparent symbolic link to the parent company, but did firmly emphasize that Screen Gems was a television studio. The full corporate name was given to show that the studio was a distinct corporate entity. Programs are billed as being either a Screen Gems Inc. production or presentation, depending on whether or not Screen Gems had produced the show itself. In 1954, the word film was added to the logo to emphasize that the shows were pre-recorded and transmitted on film, which was still something of a novelty back then. 1955 was the year when the Hollywood studios decided to stop being ridiculously covert about their involvement in television, except ironically Paramount, which seemed to go in the opposite direction around this time. As such, August saw the introduction of a new Screen Gems logo, rendering the Columbia Torch Lady in all her glory. Uh, the wording was the same, sans the word ink. The byline television subsidiary Columbia Pictures Corporation was added in a newfound zeal to acknowledge the parent company. The next year saw further integration with Columbia, with Screen Gems finally syndicating its parents' feature films. Screen Gems also acquired another syndication company, Serials Inc., also known as Go Television Films, which held syndication rights to a very impressive library of film and television. In September, there was an interstate merger between the television company, incorporated in New York, the dormant cartoon company that I mentioned earlier, which was incorporated in California, and Serials Inc. The newly combined entity retained the name used by two of its predecessors, was incorporated in California, and issued 89% of its stock to Columbia Pictures. In 1957, Screen Gems made another investment. It acquired a 20% stake in a startup television animation studio, HB Enterprises Inc., 
founded by Bill Hanna and Joe Barbara, former producers at the freshly shut down MGM Cartoon Studio. This investment included a 10-year deal whereby Screen Gems would distribute the HP Studios output. This year also saw the creation of Briskin Productions Inc., an entity under the management of studio veteran Irving Briskin, set up to run Screen Gems production operations at Columbia Pictures Studio on Gower Street, Hollywood. In 1958, Screen Gems celebrated the 10th anniversary of its incorporation in New York and seemingly temporarily did away with the distinction between film production and film presentation. This year also saw a subtle alteration to the HP Enterprises logo as well as the death of Harry Cohen from a heart attack. Columbia Pictures expanded into music this year, with Colpix Records, a recording company set up as a division of Columbia Pictures Corporation, and SG Music Corporation, a publishing company set up as a subsidiary of Screen Gems. In 1959, Screen Gems returned to the production of television commercials by acquiring Elliot Unger and Elliot Inc. This company was integrated as a division called EUE slash Screen Gems. Columbia itself also expanded into broadcasting via a new subsidiary, Columbia Pictures Electronics Company, Inc. Also, in 1959, HP Enterprises changed its name to the more widely recognized Hanna-Barbera Productions, Inc. In 1960, Screen Gems was in reincorporated in Delaware and continued to have 89% of its stock owned by Columbia Pictures. Shortly before this change came a new logo, simply placing the company name around the torch lady's legs with no extra qualifying information. This information was usually instead supplied as a voiceover. This has been a Screen Gems film production from the Hollywood studios of Columbia Pictures. In 1961, the 11% of Screen Gems stock that hadn't been issued to Columbia was floated on the stock market. A new subsidiary was established, Audience Studies Inc., to test market television programs and commercials, at first, it serviced only Screen Gems and its divisions, but eventually branched out into the lucrative business of providing its services to other companies. This year also saw Screen Gems branching out into television broadcasting. 1963 saw the consolidation of many Columbia businesses under the Screen Gems banner. SG Music Corporation was merged with Columbia's other music publishing ventures to create Screen Gems Columbia Music Inc., a New York corporation jointly owned by Columbia and Screen Gems. Columbia Pictures Electronics merged with Screen Gems Broadcasting Operations as Screen Gems Broadcasting Corporation, a subsidiary of Screen Gems. As well as that, Briskin Productions was folded back into Screen Gems. Later in that year, the ever-majestic Torch Lady was impeached as Screen Gems' corporate logo in favor of a weird animation with dancing lines and flashing circles. A voiceover continued to differentiate between production and presentation. A Screen Gems production. This may have coincided with Columbia Pictures decreasing its stake in Screen Gems to 88.64%. In 1965, Screen Gems changed its logo yet again. <laughs> The new logo involved a Latin letter S forming itself from a cheaply animated film reel, quite possibly a nod to the emphasis on the word film in previous logos. Its structure may also have been a veiled reference to that of the torch lady used by Columbia Pictures at the same time, with the red dot representing torchlight. Nevertheless, this logo has gained a great deal of infamy over the years, taking on such fond appellations as the S from Hell. Thanks in no small part to Eric Sade's cheap synthesizer music. This may once again have coincided with Columbia Pictures decreasing its stake in Screen Gems, this time to 87.1%. With the separation of the affairs of Columbia and Screen Gems, Colpix Records was no longer enough to exploit Columbia's full value on the music side of things, so it was replaced in 1966 by Col Gems Records Inc., which, as the name suggested, was a 50-50 joint venture between Columbia and Screen Gems. Most notably, it released music recorded by The Monkees, who also had a television presence thanks to Screen Gems. Its manufacturing and distribution was handled by RCA Records. Another venture involving The Monkees was Interplanetary Licensing and Merchandising Inc., which licensed their brand for use on lunchboxes and other such things. 
Between 1966 and 1967, Colombia's shareholding in screen gems decreased to 86.9%. At the start of 1967, the Screen Gems Hanna Barbera deal expired and was not renewed. Instead, Hanna Barbera was acquired outright by the Taft Broadcasting Company, thus ending its association with Colombia in every way. In 1968, the trend of separation made a complete about turn, with Colombia and Screen Gems merging into a single entity. This involved Colombia Pictures paying a lot to Screen Gems shareholders in both cash and stock. Almost all the two companies' non-music subsidiaries became divisions of a new diversified media company, Columbia Pictures Industries, Inc., incorporated in New York. This year also saw the establishment of a new record label, SGC Records, a division of Screen Gems Columbia Music. The manufacturing and distribution for this label was handled by Atlantic Records. 1969 saw more changes on the music side of things. Columbia Pictures Industries acquired Bell Records Inc. and the two companies were soon merged into a new Columbia Pictures Industries incorporated in Delaware. Call Gems Records, still a distinct entity, established its own publishing company, Call Gems Music Corporation. In 1970, following the reincorporation of Columbia Pictures Industries in Delaware, the Screen Gems jingle was shortened, removing the three staccato notes. In 1971, SGC Records and Call Gems Records were both shut down, but Screen Gems Columbia Music and Call Gems Music continued as music publishing companies. In 1972, Audience Studies Inc. was sold off. As well as that, Columbia Pictures Industries merged its studios with those of Warner Brothers to form the Burbank Studios, which I thought I should mention even though I haven't seen fit to actually show it in the diagram. In 1973, the animated logos for Columbia Divisions took on the byline A Division of Columbia Pictures Industries, Inc., in line with the names used on copyright notices. Late 1974 saw quite a bit of reorganization at Columbia Pictures Industries. A new record company was formed known as Arista Records, Inc. The operations of Bell Records, along with any holdings left over from Colpix, Colgems, and SGC, were folded into the new label. More importantly, since this video is about television, Screen Gems production and distribution operations were reorganized under the name Columbia Pictures Television, which used a new logo loosely based on the S. It appears to have been a placeholder logo. Screen Gems Broadcasting Operations, on the other hand, became part of the main corporation. In 1975, Columbia Pictures Industries started selling off some of its broadcasting operations. It also introduced a new print logo, a semi-hexacosogram in a semi-circle, representing the light from the lady's torch, rather than the torch itself as the previous print logo had done. It has become known as the Sunburst. EUE slash Screen Gems started using this as its logo as well. In June 1976, a full animated version of the Sunburst debuted on the film Murder by Death. It used a sti still shot of the previous logo, combined with brand new visual effects by Robert Abel, with music by Suzanne Ciani. <laughs> A short television version soon followed. Columbia Pictures Industries instituted a color code for its divisions at this point. Film was blue, television was orange. There were some divestments in August, including a television station and Columbia's music publishing subsidiaries. Screen Gems Columbia Music, renamed to Screen Gems EMI Music Inc., and Call Gems Music Corporation, renamed to Call Gems EMI Music Inc., were sold to the UK record label EMI. 1977 saw Columbia's exit from the broadcasting business as it sold its last station. Interplanetary licensing and merchandising was renamed to International Marketing I Limited. In 1979, Columbia finally exited the music industry 
selling Arista Records to Ariola, a Bertelsmann division which would later be the foundation for BMG. Ironically, BMG would later merge with Sony Music in 2004. On the television side, Columbia acquired TOY Productions, formerly Bud Yorkin Productions, and maintained it briefly as a subsidiary. 1980 saw the folding of TOY into Columbia Pictures Television, as well as the acquisition of Ray Star Films from Ray Stark, who had previously sold his older films to Columbia in 1974. This company included Ray Star Features Inc. and Ray Star Television Inc. In June 1981, Columbia Pictures did away with the Sunburst logo, instead experimenting with something thematically similar but with significantly different animation. A television version didn't come until later. Then, in August, Time Life Films, the film and television arm of Time Inc., was sold to Columbia Pictures Industries and folded into Columbia Pictures Television. In June of 1982, Columbia Pictures Industries was bought by the Coca-Cola Company for cash and stock worth $1.025 billion via a new subsidiary, Coca-Cola Pictures Inc. Straight afterwards, Coke incorporated an entity called CPT Holdings Inc. again in Delaware. The purpose of this entity was to take over the rights holding of old Columbia Pictures television shows, mostly from the Screen Gems days. Following this, the the new version of The Torch Lady introduced in 1981 finally got a television version using a subtly altered version of Suzanne Ciani's music from the previous logo. It sported a byline announcing the company's new ownership, which, in combination with the music that sounds like soda pouring, created a strong association between this logo type and Coke, even though it had really been devised a year before the association between the companies. It is also noteworthy that the colour coding was preserved with these new logos. The text and part of the lady's robe were blue on the movie logo and gold or orange on the television logo. In September, Columbia Pictures Industries was merged into Coca-Cola Pictures, which took on the same name. In May 1983, an extra subsidiary of Raystar Television was formed, known as Raystar Productions, Inc., then, in August, EUE slash Screen Gems was spun off as a New York corporation called EUE slash Screen Gems Limited. It was sold to longtime executive George Cooney and took with it the Screen Gems S trademark. In 1984, Coke decided to demerge Columbia Pictures and Columbia Pictures Television. Columbia Pictures Industries retained the film division, but the television division was transferred in its entirety to CPT Holdings. As such, because this is a television video, Columbia Pictures Industries will no longer appear. This reorganization was carried out as part of the establishment of a new television group. One of the units of this group was, of course, Raystar Television, but there are also a few new ones. Distribution rights to shows from the Screen Gems days were transferred into Colex Enterprises, a new partnership with LBS Communications, formerly Lexington Broadcasting Services. Another arm of the group was the Television Program Source, a new distribution company which was a joint venture between CPT, Alan Bennett and Robert King. Coca-Cola increased its television operations significantly in June of the next year with the acquisition of Norman Lear's company, Embassy Communications Inc. This included Embassy Television and Tandem Productions, both production companies, Embassy Telecommunications, a distribution company, Embassy Films Associates, a feature film company, and its own video division, Embassy Home Entertainment. The immediate effects of this sale were the addition of a Coca-Cola byline to the Embassy Telecom logo and the shutdown of Tandem Productions, turning it into an in-name only unit called Tandem Licensing Corporation. Its production operations were folded into Embassy Television. Coke also set up Embassy Pay Television, a division of Embassy Communications, for syndication to premium cable networks. On May 5th, 1986, a lot of reorganization happened. 
Embassy Television and Telecommunications, along with Tandem, were folded into Embassy Communications, which went from being a holding company to a full television company. Merv Griffin Enterprises was also acquired. It comprised three distinct companies, which were Jeopardy Productions, in charge of Jeopardy, Califon Productions, in charge of Wheel of Fortune, and Anthony Productions, in charge of Dance Fever. Around the same time, Embassy Films Associates was sold off to the Del Laurentiis Entertainment Group. Then, on November 24th, CPT's and Embassy's production operations were merged under the name Columbia Embassy Television, but they continued to operate as separate entities. The distribution operations of CPT were merged with the television program source, which became wholly owned by Columbia Embassy. Raystar Productions was folded back in as a division of Raystar Television under the new studio. On January 8, 1987, Coke reorganized its television operations into a new group called Coca-Cola Television Operations. It consisted of three main divisions, which were Columbia Embassy Television, Merv Griffin Enterprises, and Coca-Cola Telecommunications, the newly reincorporated Columbia Television Program Source Distribution Combine. February 23rd saw the formation of another new entity, CC Telecommunications Productions, Inc., to handle first-run syndication production for Coca-Cola Telecommunications. In September, dance fever ended, so Anthony Productions was shut down. In December, Coca-Cola Television Operations, as well as Columbia Pictures Industries, was moved under TriStar Pictures, which was reorganized in a stock swap as Columbia Pictures Entertainment, with Coke holding an 80% stake. On January 1st, 1988, Columbia Embassy Television was renamed to Columbia Pictures Television, with Embassy Communications becoming a limited partnership called ELP Communications, in name only under the newly reorganized division. Coca-Cola Telecommunications became Columbia Pictures Television Distribution as the Colex partnership with LBS was dissolved. However, Columbia and LBS continued to co-distribute many former Colex shows over the next few years. Merv Griffin Enterprises continued to operate as it had previously. Over the next few days, the logos were updated to reflect this reorganization with Embassy's logo disappearing on January 2nd and CPT's byline being changed on January 4th with some new music to boot. On the latter date, TriStar Television, a division of Columbia Pictures Entertainment, was folded into Columbia Pictures Television, but its name and logo continued to appear on shows that were recorded but not yet aired. It was around this time that Coke decreased its stake from 80% to 49%. Merv Griffin Enterprises continued to use a Coca-Cola byline until February 8th, which is understandable, considering that CC Television Operations was still technically the parent of the group. TriStar Television's logo continued to appear until around March. Its disappearance may have been timed to coincide with the incorporation of a new TriStar Pictures unit on February 23rd. In July, the reorganization was made official. Columbia Pictures Television, Coca-Cola Television Operations, TriStar Television, and Columbia Pictures Television Distribution merged into a new entity using the Columbia name. The Coca-Cola name was now purged from the operation, with Columbia Pictures Television Distribution being the only subdivision of the new entity. The shows formerly produced by TriStar continue to be distributed by Televentures, a joint venture between Columbia Pictures Entertainment, Stephen J. Cannell Productions, and with slash Thomas slash Harris Productions. It was also around this time that Columbia formed its own international production and distribution arm, Columbia Pictures International Television. This was not a distinct entity, but operated out of the regional offices of other internationally operating Columbia divisions, hence the Green Box. January 1989 saw a reanimation of the Columbia Pictures Television logo using footage from the 1981 movie logo. While it was an extremely cheap and cheesy looking job, it seemed to get the point across that the Columbia Pictures no longer referred to Columbia Pictures Industries, but to Columbia Pictures Entertainment, 
so the old color coding scheme no longer applied. In September, Sony Corporation of America acquired Coke's 49% stake in Columbia Pictures Entertainment. Then, in November, they bought out the other 51%. Straight after that, they acquired Goober Peters Television Inc., or the Goober Peters Entertainment Company, formerly Barris Industries. It became a subsidiary of Columbia Pictures Television. This also had two syndication divisions, which were Goober Peters Program Sales and Goober Peters Advertising Sales, and it was mostly involved in producing game shows. On July 11th, 1990, Televentures was dissolved, resulting in the distribution rights to many of its shows reverting to Columbia Pictures Television Distribution. Then, in November, Goober Peters Program and Advertising Sales were folded into Columbia Pictures Television Distribution. Its production operations continued in a limited fashion into December. In late 1991, a few things happened. Columbia Pictures Entertainment was renamed to Sony Pictures Entertainment, and in keeping with this, its television operations were reorganized under a new group called Sony Television Entertainment. This was an internal corporate division, though its name was never used on screen. The hyphen was also dropped from the name of TriStar Pictures and a new television studio was founded with that name, built from assets that Sony acquired from New World Television. This, along with Merv Griffin Enterprises, started operating under the umbrella of Sony Television Entertainment with a high degree of autonomy. John Feldheimer ran the new studio, continuing his role from New World Television. In December, the Goober Peters Entertainment Company produced one last TV movie, Christmas on Division Street, then was folded into Columbia Pictures Television. In 1992, the byline, a Sony Pictures Entertainment Company, was added to all three studios' logos, in the case of Columbia, and TriStar. This also meant the unveiling of totally new logos, which were painted by Michael Diaz and Alan Rengold, respectively. In 1993, another logo was painted by Michael Diaz for Sony, this time for Merv Griffin Enterprises, the Columbia and TriStar logos also got new music. At another point during this year, the in-name only Columbia Pictures Television division of CPT Holdings was folded into the main Columbia Pictures Television studio. More reorganization happened in 1994. On February 21st, the three production studios were brought under the umbrella of a new division, Columbia TriStar Television, again run by John Feldheimer. They still operated as very much separate studios, but management became more consolidated. At the same time, Columbia Pictures Television Distribution began to be referred to internally as Columbia TriStar Television Distribution, but the old name continued to be used legally and on screen for the time being. On June 4th, Merv Griffin Enterprises was folded into the new division, but its logo continued to appear until July 22nd. Then, in September, a logo was introduced for Columbia TriStar Television. 1995 saw more changes. John Feldheimer was promoted to head of Sony Television Entertainment, which ceased to exist shortly after. Sony's television operations were reorganized as the Columbia TriStar Television Group. As part of this change, Columbia Pictures International Television became Columbia TriStar International Television and started using its name on screen for the first time in a new animated logo. The production studios continued operating in the same way, albeit with a reduced degree of separation from the distribution company. It was also around this time that an alternate jingle was introduced for TriStar Television. On July 12, 1996, the production studios were further consolidated, now operating under the auspices of a new centralized production company, Columbia TriStar Television Inc. ELP and CPT now operated directly under this company and name instead of Columbia Pictures Television. 
While this is hard to represent on the diagram due to the nitty gritty of the corporate structure, Columbia Pictures Television was actually a sub studio of this new unit. At the same time, Columbia TriStar Television Distribution finally became the legal and on screen name for the distribution company. Columbia TriStar International Television's logo was also updated to reflect the changes. As well as that, the Columbia TriStar Television Group started an animation unit, Adelaide Productions, which operated autonomously but used the Columbia TriStar Television name and logo. The cartoons produced by the studio used the two CTT logos interchangeably. A strange thing happened in 1998. All of the group's production operations were merged into a partnership between Sony Pictures and Global Maritime Group, a cruise line company. This new partnership was called Global Entertainment Productions GmbH and Company Median KG, and, as you can tell, operated out of Germany for some reason. The studio seemed to have continued operating with the same degree of autonomy, but for legal and copyright purposes. All the work was done by this new partnership, at least for the 1998 to 1999 season. An exception was TriStar Television, which needed to remain open to avoid changing the status of Early Edition, a show which it co-owned with CBS. This was the only show for which this was done, however. Strangest part, though, is that it was completely reversed in 1999. It went back to the old way. There were two differences, though. ELP Communications ceased all production operations because Beekman's World was finished and TriStar Television was shut down. However, again, because the copyright on early edition was co-owned by TriStar and CBS, the TriStar Television Corporation continued to stay open. The actual production was done by Columbia TriStar Television, but TriStar Television remained the copyright holder in name only. At the same time, Columbia TriStar Television introduced an enhanced version of its logo, which actually used cheaper animation, but apparently was more suited to high definition. In May of the millennium year, Columbia TriStar Television finally stopped using its first logo for anything. Early edition was cancelled, so TriStar Television Inc. was shut down as a production company. Columbia TriStar Television Inc. began to be referred to as Columbia TriStar Network Television, at this stage producing shows only for traditional broadcast networks, except Califon and Jeopardy, which produced for syndication via King World Productions. As well as all that, Raystar Television was folded into Columbia TriStar Network Television after producing the TV movie Alley Cat Strike. On the 1st of January 2001, the Columbia Pictures Television studio was shut down and folded into Columbia TriStar Network Television. At this stage, this was a singular division with unified management, but it encompassed some operations of both Columbia Pictures Television Inc. and Columbia TriStar Television Inc., You may remember what I said earlier about Early Edition being co-owned by TriStar and CBS. Well, Sony reckoned that this was becoming a trend. Since the financial interest and syndication, or FinCEN, laws were repealed by the FCC in the early 90s, networks seemed to want more and more to own a share in their programming so they could make a bundle on syndication. This was bad news for Columbia TriStar Network Television, as the bulk of its revenues came from syndication via Columbia TriStar Television Distribution. At this point, all the other major Hollywood studios had either acquired or set up their own network, but this path was blocked to Sony thanks to its Japanese ownership. Thus, a decision had to be made in relation to the seemingly loss-making future of Columbia TriStar Network Television. Thus, on October 25th, this Doom division was shut down. At the same time, Columbia TriStar Television Distribution was renamed to Columbia TriStar Domestic Television, but as you can see, the old legal name was still used for copyright purposes on some shows. This newly renamed division took over the production of all the old network shows. In the case of The King of Queens, Columbia TriStar Television Inc. remained as an in-name only production company because, as with TriStar and Early Edition, the show was co-owned by CBS. The group was streamlined, with all operations being moved under Columbia TriStar Domestic Television, even Columbia TriStar International Television. 
As well as that, the logo types were unified, with the same animation and imagery being used on the domestic and international logos. The newly renamed division also expressed hopes to work with next generation broadband technology. Then, this whole next generation and innovation idea inspired another change in late 2002. Columbia Pictures Television Inc. was renamed to Sony Pictures Television Inc., resulting in the first on-screen use of the Sony Pictures Barris logo. <laughs> Columbia TriStar International Television was also renamed to Sony Pictures Television International. As you can see, the Columbia TriStar domestic television name and logo were still used by Sony on some shows for a while, along with the in-name only Columbia TriStar Television Distribution. In 2003, the loose ends in Sony Pictures Television's corporate structure were mostly tied up, so now, it was bars all the way in terms of logos, with a new animation being introduced for Sony Pictures Television International. In 2004, the in-name only Columbia TriStar domestic television was shut down. On November 24th, Sony moved into the growing Chinese television market with a partnership with the China film group called Huaso. This was the first government-approved television joint venture in Communist China. On February 8, 2007, Sony Pictures Television International acquired a 51% majority stake in Lean M O O O, a Russian production company. Subsequently, The King of Queens ended, and so therefore did Columbia TriStar Television's role as a production company. In 2008, Sony Pictures Television International set up a Dutch holding company, 2JS Productions BV. It used this as a takeover vehicle to acquire the television and mobile entertainment company Two-Way Traffic NV. More importantly, this company had a format licensing subsidiary, Two-Way Traffic International BV, formerly Celador International, known for holding the rights to the format of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, among other things. In January 2009, Sony Pictures Television acquired another interactive entertainment and format licensing company, Embassy Row LLC. Two weeks later, Sony Pictures Television International acquired a 50% stake in Teleset, a Colombian production company which was already doing shows licensed from Two-Way Traffic International. On April Fool's Day of that year, Sony Pictures Television International was shut down and folded into Sony Pictures Television, citing reasons to do with the globalization of entertainment and such. Embassy Row and Two-Way Traffic became more consolidated into the parent company as a result. Then, on April 13th, Sony's stake in Lean M was increased to 67%. In October, Sony Pictures Television expanded its international operations by establishing Toro Produzione, SPA, an Italian production and distribution company, which also operated in Spain. In 2010, Lean M, the Russian company, became a wholly owned subsidiary of Sony Pictures Television. On March 22nd of this year, Sony acquired another Dutch television production and interactive entertainment company, Tuvalu Media BV. Then, on July 12th, which was the 14th anniversary of the formation of Columbia TriStar Television Inc., Sony Pictures Television created Floresta, a joint venture production company in Brazil. On June 23, 2011, Sony Pictures Television formed a UK production company, Victory Television, as a partnership with Victoria Ashbourne, who had previously worked for them as Senior Vice President of Creative Development under Sony Pictures Television International. On March 1st, 2012, at the beginning of the regrettably unsuccessful Black March campaign, which you know is only slightly relevant, Sony Pictures Television acquired another UK production company, Silver River Productions Limited. One month later, at the conclusion of that same only slightly relevant campaign, most of two-way traffic's operations were folded into Sony Pictures Television as Sony Pictures Television International Formats. Then, on August 23rd, 
Sony Pictures Television acquired a majority stake in yet another UK production company, Left Bank Pictures Limited. So, that basically concludes the colourful history of this highly influential media company. Now, there is a faction that would see Sony Pictures sold to CBS Corporation, which would almost certainly cause Sony Pictures Television to be folded into CBS Studios. However, the higher-ups at Sony maintain that it is a key part of their business and will not be put up for sale. Special thanks to Shadid329 for help with putting all this together. My other sources include the Delaware Corporation Register, Corporation Wiki, Bloomberg Business Week, and the book Screen Gems, A History of Columbia Pictures Television from Cone to Coke, written by J.P.H. Perry. I hope you enjoyed the video.